Hi y'all, in this video I'll be responding to a video titled uh, A Study in Smugitude by uh, Super Princess Tea Party, herself a feminist, and it is addressing the back and forth started by uh, the video co uh, collaboration done by Christy Winters, uh, questions addressed to anti-social justice warriors. And this particular feminist is taking issue with the smug tone of the Christy Winters group. And then some of the back and forth and why you're getting the, why they're going to get some of the responses that they've gotten. Uh, you know, if you start off being a smug asshole, what do you really expect? How do you expect people to respond to you? But anyway, uh, so hi there, uh, Super Princess Tea Party. I agree with some of what you've said in your video, but I disagree with some other things that you've said in your video. And you have some uh, misconceptions that I, I want to, to address. So um, anyway, there's a part where you're talking about safe spaces and you were upbraiding one of the feminists for not um, taking seriously like how it's the, the term is understood by uh, antis, which is essentially that it is a bubble for fragile people who can't handle criticism. Uh, you defined it in uh, words similar to that. And then you're explaining that safe spaces can just, you know, they can be a way for people to reach out and get the help when they need it. And that most people would be fine with that. Um, and I, I agree, most people are fine with having a space where you can go to decompress. Uh, if pressures are getting to you, you can go relax, whatever it is. Uh, typically, these are called bars or someone's home you know, or dorm room, but whatever. Uh, what they take issue with is the, is the idea of safe spaces as a way to block criticism, as well as public areas uh, being labeled as safe spaces, uh, presumably for the previous purpose. And I, I agree with that. These statements of yours are incomplete, but they are true. And I don't mean incomplete in any deceptive way, just that there's more to be said about them than you said. So, anyway. Uh, and then, uh, so you say you disagree with uh, their being used in public spaces. There's the campus police. There, I'm sorry, the campus security. There's the police to keep people from beating you up or stealing your stuff. And that's about the most safeness that you can expect out in public. And you think that the problem with safe spaces is one of marketing and that the antis dislike the word safe. Uh, if, you, if they were called respect spaces, people wouldn't really have the outrage. And uh, so, let's get on to these. Um, safe spaces are indeed a bubble for fragile people who can't handle criticism, and you are perfectly tr perfectly correct, but not for the reasons that you seem to think, with respect to why they're called safe spaces, that it is a marketing issue. They were named that deliberately. And this is one of the objections to feminism that I have. It's like any other movement that wants to co-op something else. Oh, look, there's this other thing over there that's... Uh, being successfully done. Let's steal their shit and use that and then see how it works out. So if you want to get your own little space where you get you get to lay the rules down, all you have to do is name it something that people can't possibly disagree with. Like, this is an anti-rape space. Oh, you disagree with our anti-rape space? Well, obviously, you want it to be a rape space. So it, it's to put uh, that rhetorical trick into play right off the bat. This is done on purpose. So a safe space. Who could possibly disagree with a place where people could go? To, if they're being beaten, they could go there uh, and someone will help them stop being beaten. Who could disagree? Only, only the haters in the world. Clearly, the only people who could disagree are the ones who want to do the beating. They're the abusers, the bullies, the harassers, the rapists. Those are the people who, uh, who, those are the only people who could possibly disagree with our safe space. The problem is, the people aren't in any danger to start off with. So it has nothing whatever to do with that. That's just the rhetorical shuck and jive. It means it's a place where people can't go to criticize us, where where people need to, to, to remember that they're in a space where they need to walk on very, very delicate eggshells. I mean, these eggshells are very delicate. You need to be very, very careful on what you say. And this, this is a part of the way of protecting those of the body, those of the ideology, from harsh words and bad words and rude words that might cause them some cognitive dissonance. You know, the threat of people disagreeing with them. That is the danger, as with, uh, as, well, as you'd expect from an ideology. There used to be these things called McGruff houses, and uh, they were safe spaces, not so named, but that's what, that's their function, uh, that's what their function was, and it was for children. Everywhere you saw one of these little McGruff dogs in a window, um, the person had been back, a background investigation, a complete background investigation had been done by law enforcement to include interviews with neighbors in previous places. They, I mean, they really did a thorough background investigation on these people. Uh, so that way, children would know that if they're in any danger, or they think they're in any danger, if they misperceive a situation and they're wrong, it's better to run there and get help than, than you know, not. If they get lost, 
if they're separated from their parents and they can't find them, which is just another way to say they get lost. If they fall down and get hurt, one of your friends falls down and get, gets hurt, you can run to these. One of your kids is one of your friends is kidnapped, you can run to one of these. You, you know, they have lists of phone numbers. You go there. There are people who have promised to help protect you from the instant harm and to summon the appropriate aid that you will require, whether it be medical, police, whatever it is. Now, on, on the, the front, in respect of being kidnapped from, you know, the stranger danger, this, these reactions were completely out of proportion to any threat that actually existed. About 115 such incidents happen per year where a stranger, like a stone-cold stranger, actually abducts a child in the United States. It just really very, very, very rarely happens. It almost never happens. Um, on the other hand, with a lost child or an injured child or uh, you know any of these other things, more than 2,000 children go missing every day in the United States. Every single day in the United States, more than 2,000 children will go missing. Most of them are found quite quickly. They've just wandered off. They've gotten lost. There's been a report generated 30 years ago, 40 years ago. They wouldn't, uh, law enforcement wouldn't address these cases until the person had been gone for some number of days. One of the problems with that is that law enforcement simultaneously knew that um, if the person had in fact been kidnapped and they in fact were not already looking for them, most children who are kidnapped are killed, if they're, if they're going to be killed, they're dead within the first eight hours. Uh, like about half of them, first eight hours, and most of them within the first 24 hours. So that was really just a way of not having to worry about that inconvenient search party because if we wait long enough, the corpses will turn up or the living child will, you know, be found somewhere and return home. So we don't have to waste resources on dealing with the, this kind of thing. That's one of the background things that just is lurking in law enforcement. There was a hue and cry, properly so. Law enforcement were not investing resources into addressing these cases. That had some consequences many of which were good, some of which were poorly, con uh, poorly conceived, like the Stranger Danger tapes that were, were done all over the place. Stranger strangers were not the danger that was at issue. It was dis uh, pissed off parents. It was disgruntled neighbors. It was sexual predators who just happened to live next door to you and had managed to uh, you know, get, get in your good graces and your child trusted them and you know, things of that nature. So on the stranger part, complete, the fear is completely unjustified. It's completely out of proportion. It's, it's hysterical. That is the same relationship that women have, or feminists, I should say, have to rape. Their fear of rape is wholly out of proportion, wildly out of proportion, to the actual threat that they face. It is hysterical. This is one of the reasons why people like me object to safe spaces. They're not respect space. I mean, that's the, the function of it. It is, well, it's not just respect, it's la, 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 our space, you can't talk spaces. Um, but it's in the guise of, we are in danger. That is what it means to say that this place is safe. That there is a physical threat when there isn't. That's why these people are emotional cripples. Emotional basket cases. What was it you said? Uh, perceived to be uh, a bubble for fragile people who can't handle criticism. There's something, uh, we, you know, they, feminists love to talk about rape culture. God, do they love to talk about rape culture. I mean, just, they like to talk about rape all day long. If, if that's all they could ever talk about, it seems like that's all they'd ever talk about. Rape, 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 rape. There's something called the gender fear paradox, which is actually is not a paradox at all. And it is that uh, women's reaction to fear is out of proportion to the actual threats that they face vis-a-vis -vis how men react to it. And you betrayed uh, this particular uh, behavior later in your video, and I'll get to it now. You say, oh, as a woman, safety has a positive connotation. You know, walking alone at night, uh, safety is what you're trying to achieve. But for people who don't have to worry about their safety, aka men, the idea can be kind. Uh, the idea can kind of become a synonym for convention, following the rules, whatever, whatever, whatever. No, uh, that's not true. It's that whenever there is a claim that I'm in danger, the solution offered up by women is not typically let me see what I can do to deal with the matter. It's Men, yes, men, yes, all of you, please gather round. You have more work to do. Why are you just sitting around wasting your time <laughs> attending to, I don't know, a television program, going out for a beer with your buddy, whatever it is, doing your own studies so you can pass your exam? Why are you wasting your time seeing to your issues in life? There are women who are demanding safety. Get off your asses and go do something. 
This is unlike, for example, the uh, LGBT uh, people have, um, uh, there's a, well, they have the Pink Panthers, a group that goes out at various times of the year when they're, they think, oh, we might have some gay bashings that are going to happen, so we need to be out in force. Uh, for whatever reasons, they've you know, decided on whatever days they go out, fine, whatever, knock yourself out. There are ancillary benefits to other people because they're not just going to walk by you know, some person getting his ass kicked and go, wait, are you gay? No, all right, <laughs> sorry, sorry to interrupt, have a good day. Or we're only looking for gay people getting bashed. You know, they're going to intervene. They're going to call the cops. But then there's another group, which is even better than the Pink Panthers. They're called the Pink Pistols. And as you might imagine, they carry guns. <laughs> so there, there are benefits there that accrue to other people too, even though, uh, like in, in Seattle and Tacoma, the incidence of gay bashings are very low. They do happen from time to time. You get a couple per year, uh, but they just almost never happen. So the... What they're doing there is a reaction that is not actually based on any threat faced. It is really just erring on the side of caution, over <laughs> being overly cautious. Uh, better to be safe than sorry, kind of thing. Which whatever. But they, this is and this is the crucial distinction. They perceive a problem, a threat. They handle it. This is not what feminists do. This is not what women typically do. Um, and I hate speaking in generalities because there are exceptions all over the place. Not all men are brave. Not all. Not all women are uh, over, uh, over concerned about threats that they don't face. They can actually reason this shit out and go, oh, well, you know, if I do have like some weird you know, hip check emotion thing going on here, that's my problem to solve, not everybody else's, because it is vastly out of proportion to the threat. And indeed, there's a video somewhere on YouTube of a mom um, who is, uh, she does a lot of advocacy work in child abduction cases and protecting kids and whatnot. And she is staunchly opposed to all of the resources being wasted on stranger danger because those resources could actually be out there right now finding missing children and they aren't being deployed to find missing children because they're out worried about the boogeyman this woman's child was abducted and killed by a stranger but nevertheless she's able to look at the data and go the reaction to the actual threats we face is wholly emotional it is wholly irrational and it is leaving children to be killed and raped and for those people who think, oh, you, I'm sure we're doing things, there's a list on a server in Washington, D.C. that has 600,000 names on it. 600,000 names on it. All of them are children who are missing. No one is looking for them. Resources that could be deployed to bring home some of these 600,000 children are not going to be deployed because it's being wasted on nonsense in reaction to a threat uh, that just simply almost doesn't exist. And this woman is quite rightly uh, concerned about that. She has scaled her, her concern for the issue uh, in proportion to the actual threats faced by the, by the, in this case, children. That is intelligent. It is rational. It is not an emotional overreaction, which is the entire discussion about rape that feminists are having, which is, is why whenever a subject comes up, you have to associate any dissenting opinion, anything you don't like, with violence, with rape. Uh, this is internet violence. What the hell is internet violence? Did to, is there a punch o matic that people have? Because if there is, I could use one of those. I could think of some good uses for something where I could hit a button on my phone and <laughs> someone gets one right in the kisser. Although, there'd be a downside. I tend to piss a lot of people off. <laughs> Sitting on my computer would be like this all day. Kind of like when I'm at the truck stop bathroom. Anyway, now there used to be, well, still is, something called the Safe Zone Project. When I went back to college, um, I saw these stickers, and I was like, what are these all about? And I was like, Safe Zone Project. Well, that sounds interesting. So it was to protect LGBTQ people, and I'm like, oh, I'm, in, I'm one of the, the LGBTQ, L M N O P Z zebra, whatever. I'll check this out and see what it's all about. Uh, you know, I work in law enforcement. Maybe I can, maybe I can assist. Boy, was this a mistake on my part to go to one of these meetings. It's like going to an AA meeting where people just want to sit around and whine and cry and bemoan the fact that someone somewhere, sometime or other, did something that they don't like and no one was hurt. And I'm like, where's the... Am I in the wrong meeting? Where's the safety part? Uh, uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm all for safety, for safe spaces. Like the McGruff houses. If you are, in fact, being, if you're being chased, if you've fallen down and been hurt, you're lost, Whatever, you know, you're bleeding. Well, I guess if you're a woman, that might not. I might need to make a, a further refinement of that proposition. 
if you're bleeding from somewhere you shouldn't be bleeding from, yeah, go there. But that is not what this is about. So you're right, it is a marketing thing. But the reason that it isn't called a respect space is because if you call it that, you're going to get the well, similar result now. Whatever you, you want respect, you go hide yourself in there and get it all you want. You're not going to get the uh, support that you're going to get if you call it a safe space. Because, as I mentioned earlier, the only possible people who can disagree with the safe space are the people who want dangerous spaces. You know, the rapists. That's why it's called that. And um, not to be too rude about it, I'll address more of this in your talk in response to your toxic masculinity video. Um, there is never any shortage of feminists, no matter which group they're from, uh, and how much they profess to be interested in men's issues. There is never a shortage of feminists who are willing to go around and femsplain what being a man is like what men do and don't deal with. Let me just admonish you gently. You don't have the faintest clue what it is like to be a man. I don't have the faintest clue of what it is like to be a woman. All right, I'll address uh, more of this in more detail and politely there too in a, a separate video on your, uh, in response to your toxic masculinity video. Have a great day, everybody.